salvation. This is a call for salvation. If you do not know Jesus, this is a call for salvation. A call for salvation. Respond to the call for salvation. If you don't know the Savior, this is his presentation. Hello, welcome to Voices in the Wilderness. I'm Reverend Maria. The Bible tells us that John the Baptist was a messenger, a voice in the wilderness calling to his generation to repent. Jesus also said to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repenting simply means to regret your sins, to change your way of thinking, and to change your conduct. Our own generation is in trouble. We too need to change our conduct. At a national and international level, we're plagued with wars, rumors of wars, terrorism, the breakdown of the family, moral confusion, and numerous other societal ills. But yet, we believe that with God, there is hope. We can live a life by a higher standard and influence our families, our communities, and the world. My guest today is Father Dimitri Sala. He is called to evangelical preaching, an apostolic ministry. He's an author, a conference speaker, a teacher, and a man of prayer. Welcome, Father Sala. Thank you. It is an honor to have you back on our program. I'm excited to be invited again. Thanks. Well, you were here in 2006. Yes. And um, we, the, the name of that show was A Vision of Unity. Mm. I don't know if you remember that. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, you've had this wonderful, passionate desire to see the, the body of Christ unite. And uh, you said, uh, you made a prophetic statement at that time. I, I can't quote it exactly, but it was something along the lines that uh, we were heading for this time that we needed to have the body of Christ united. And I've had several since then uh, guests with the same passion, and I'm seeing more and more of that. So um, that's, that's wonderful because, you know, the Bible says that the, the Lord's going to come for one body, one bride. One bride. So that's exciting. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to also to congratulate you on your book because you're an author. Thank and you. And I'm going to hold it up. And it's called The Stained Glass Curtain, Crossing the Evangelical Catholic Divide to Find Our Common Heritage. So I'm going to hold it up so our audience could see it. Okay, great. So I'm excited about talking. Uh, I, I want to hear about this book today. But before we do that, can you tell us a little bit about your own personal journey? Just um, how did you become a priest? Well, um, actually, as a, as a young boy, I had a thirst for the things of God, and uh, church kind of fascinated me, and also came from a hurting family, and so I was, I was searching. I was, I was looking for love, and um, it led me towards, uh, towards uh, wanting to seek the Lord personally. I, started reading the Bible and starting to learn how to pray. And um, I began to have personal experiences with the Lord that convinced me that He was for real and what He was saying about Himself in the Bible was, was true. Not, not always understandable, but mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. And so, um, actually I had a, a personal encounter uh, at one point in my life in which I surrendered my life to Jesus and, um, and really experienced in a physical way the presence of the Holy Spirit. Wow. And um, and then it led me into a conversion of, of what you know evangelicals would call being born again. Mm -hmm. And uh, when that happened and my life began to change, I had peace and and uh, you know like something to really live my life for rather than just myself yes. and my own talents or my own control. And uh, and so I said, I, I the whole world's got to know about this. Right. And being a Catholic, I thought the best way to do that would be to become a, a priest so that I could use. Uh, you know, the position on the pulpit and even in celebrating the sacraments with people to impart this message. That's wonderful. So you became uh, born again first and then you became a priest. Yes. So when you were in the priesthood um, going through seminary, mm -hmm. did they teach the gospel in seminary? Well, that's a real hot question. Okay. Uh, you know, naturally, if we ask that to, to my professors and, and formation directors, they would say, of course we did. Mm -hmm. But when we say the gospel, I think what, what you're referring to is the basic message of salvation, of how does a person, uh, how can a person be made right with God right. and have a basic assurance of, of, you know, being together with him for all eternity, here and for all eternity. And no, that information was not taught. Mm -hmm. However, at the mm -hmm. time, in the Catholic Church, uh, in a movement called the Charismatic Renewal, mm -hmm. that message was coming across. It wasn't as clear as I like 
to present it because mm -hmm. I believe that's the most important information a person can have. Mm -hmm. But I found it. I found it. So, uh, and, and I found it was not incompatible with being part of my church. That's, that's wonderful that you found it and so many other Catholics are finding it because mm -hmm. um, I was raised Catholic too and mm -hmm. I really don't ever remember right. anybody talking about right. salvation. And, right. But as you said, it's not that it wasn't, um, it wasn't there but maybe not explained correctly or I'm really not sure because I know that um, uh, there's official Catholic teaching right. and that's, then there's other teaching that we hear that might not be the official Catholic right. teaching, right? right? And so there's so many misconceptions mm -hmm. uh, about that. Maybe you can clear some of those up because I think one of the ways that we're really going to unite is that we have an understanding about what we believe and hopefully we can get down to the, accept the basics or, or the essentials, mm -hmm. right? So I, I know um, some people would think that the Catholics are taught to, um, uh, to worship statues, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or that uh, salvation comes through works, mm -hmm. or that um, uh, Mary, that's, she's a way to, to salvation, mm -hmm. right? And then you have all these other things mm -hmm. like uh, the priesthood and whether or not they can get married or not, and all of these misunderstandings that people are always uh, curious about. So I wonder if you can clear some of those up for us. Well, um uh, before I get into specifics, uh, you, you really hit a really important point that I had to, uh, issue rather, that I had to face uh, when I was coming through because I was actually being challenged by evangelicals saying, you know, your church doesn't preach the Bible and, and all the things that they had heard right. from the Catholic Church. And some of them were ex-Catholics, so this came from their experience. So what that forced me to do is to do my homework. Okay. And I actually, uh, certainly during, during studies before ordination, but even afterwards, uh, I began to explore what does the Catholic Church officially teach about these subjects. It would be no surprise that, you know, uh, in this day as well as in other times in history, that uh, oftentimes what's officially in the documents is not what people are hearing. Mm -hmm. And so that unfortunately is, is the situation in so many places today. And so I call myself a document-based Catholic, not an experience-based Catholic. The okay. documents cleared up some of the stuff that, that experientially I was taught and told. Mm. So, you know, like, like, like you, I mean, we, we came from the same neighborhood, right? right? right, right. And so we're, we're talking about the same situation right. there. You know, I, I got the impression, just like Martin Luther did, you know, that, that if you do enough good works and if you're, you know, a good enough Catholic or you go to church or prayer or, or do all these holy things, that that's going to make you right with God. Right, you know? right. And that's not what our official church teachings have to say. Um, so that would be one example. Uh, regarding Mary, that's, a, that's another hot topic that mm -hmm. people ask about. Um, you know, we honor her as, as the mother of Jesus, and there are certainly differences the way we and perhaps Orthodox would look at, at the role of Mary versus the way a classic Protestant position might be or, or evangelical position. But both of us are the same in our official teachings in that whatever we say about Mary can never anyway compromise the unique and irreplaceable role of Jesus mm -hmm. as the mediator, as the Son of God, as the Savior. So we don't believe Mary saves us. We don't believe her prayers save us. Mm -hmm. Uh, we believe that it's the finished work of, of Calvary, officially in our teachings. Amen. That's, that's great because um, you're right. Sometimes there's so much misconception mm -hmm. and we hear things and, uh, you know, almost to, to the point that people think that uh, den certain denominations are cultish or whatever. Sure. Sure. But it's, um, I'm, I'm so glad. I, I think this is so wonderful because you really do clear up some of these things in this this book, so I think this book is for such a time as this. I appreciate I that. I really, really do. It, it's um, it's wonderful, and so um, th the thing with uh, with priests being able to marry or not or not uh, marry that's um, I think there's two segments right in the Catholic Church that a lot of people don't know that either. Can mm -hmm. you kind of explain that? Sure, it's a little curiosity, and, yeah. and as you as you uh, alluded to, I do bring that up. Uh, in the stained glass curtain as an example of how we can we can really be unaware of certain things by our experience. So uh, in the in the universal church, you know, throughout all history, we basically had two branches: the west and the east, mm -hmm. and uh, different types of spirituality, different ways of expressing themselves, different kinds of worship, but the same basic doctrine and, and mm -hmm. belief in Jesus. Uh, so in history. 
what happened was uh, at a certain time in history, uh, in the Western church, they made a decision uh, to impose celibacy on, on priests, uh, really as a, as a practical solution over the fact that priests were running around doing all kinds of wild and crazy things. And, <laughs> and you know, I mean, arguably somebody could look at history and say that was an overreaction. All right, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not here to evaluate that, right, but that's right, just what happened. Right. But in the East, uh, they, never, they never relinquished the practice of, of allowing priests to marry. And so even today, even in Chicago, some people that I know are married priests and they are thoroughly Catholic. They celebrate the Eucharist. You know, they're, they're in what we call the Byzantine rite. Uh, and there are other rites as well, R-I-T-E, mm -hmm. rituals, ways of, of operating in Christianity. Uh, and that's always been part of their tradition. And, and in their part of Christianity, they never required that of, of their priests. So Very there's never been a time where there haven't been married priests, if you want to understand it in that term. I mean, and this is really wonderful to know that, mm -hmm. I mean, not only that, but just that their Catholicism, right? I mean, it's based on so many solid, wonderful, very similar to Protestant, mm -hmm. but yet uh, through history or whatever, um, bad communication, uh, that's, you know, that's why we're so divided. Or, or you, you uh, tell me, how did we get so divided? Well, it actually started in the New Testament church. Anybody who reads their Bible knows that Paul took the first, uh, for, to the church in Corinth and 1 Corinthians took them to task over the fact that they had four camps and, you know, we're not talking about a million people here. Mm -hmm. We're talking probably about a, a, you know, a smaller group of people that even back then were able to say, well, I'm Paul's follower. I'm Apollos. I belong mm -hmm. to Peter. I'm none of them. I belong to Jesus, right, you know. Right, right. And he's like, he, Paul is saying basically, you know, you're, you're missing the whole point of what it means to be the church. Yes, God anoints and uses specific people, but, but you know, he, he says with anguish in his heart, is Christ divided? Mm. And so from that point on, and, and Paul calls it for what I think it really is. I mean, he uses the term, you're, you're still on milk when you should be on meat. That's a right. biblical way of saying this is really immaturity. Right. right. And so there's always going to be differences in the church. It's how we handle the differences, whether we handle it in a mature way or an immature way. So for perhaps a thousand years, you know, we, we were able to, to hang in there as one universal church. Uh, that's what the word Catholic means. It means universal. It's mm -hmm. not a denomination. It simply means universal yes. church, mm -hmm. right? And then we had a big political breakup with the church in the East and the church in the West. And so today we have the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. We're like, we're like feuding brothers, you know? Mm -hmm. And now there's a lot of, of, of work saying, you know, uh, both by bishops and, and theologians to say, we need to pull this back together, yes. you know? Uh, but then the real tragedy also happened in the 16th century with Martin Luther. And again, it was a legitimate conflict. Martin Luther had an encounter with grace, mm. powerful encounter yes. with grace. And like you and like me, basically he thought that what Christianity was all about was, you know, muscling it down and doing it by works. Right. And he, he burned himself out. Yes. And God, because he was searching for God, God just intervened and said, no, it's by grace. Well, as he began to wrestle with his own issues, uh, you know, there were some fine-tuning points that perhaps he needed to dialogue about, and so they got into it, you know, with, with the church authorities and the theologians and whatnot. Unfortunately, uh, the church leaders just, you know, snapped the process in, in midstream and said, no more. Yes. Either you recant or we'll burn you at the stake, you know, or chop mm -hmm. your head off, whatever they did in those mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you know, Martin Luther became bitter, and so he dug his heels in and we had the Hatfields and McCoys in the church, <laughs> not just feuding cousins, but I mean, right. just whole families right. Right. that literally to the point of bloodshed at times, yes. you know, over doctrinal issues or over practices. And, and, and the real problem wasn't the, the differences. The problem was the way we handled it or didn't handle the differences mm -hmm. in a very immature way. And I think, and thank God, by the time we got to the 20th century, Christians were saying, enough already. Right. This is not of God. This is getting crazy. You know, stop the insanity. <laughs> right. And so uh, uh, certainly theologians, but also uh, certain church ministers would begin to dialogue with one another, pray together. Yes. You know, and God has been re-knitting the body since the beginning of the 20th century. That, 
and that, that's, that needs to happen. That yes. really needs to yes. happen. Uh, especially these days where people are, and I don't know, it just seems that more and more even um, yeah, politically and, mm -hmm. and every way, people are being more divided. Fragmented, yes. Fragmented, mm -hmm. and it's got to stop. Yeah. You know, it's got to, yeah. because that's really not Jesus, is it, Father Sal? Right. Now, right. Um, what does the word ecumenical mean to you? Ecumenical, there's, there's a, another buzz, hot yeah. buzzword, right? right? Because in, in some circles, people really get nervous when they hear the word ecumenical because uh, some people interpret ecumenism to mean, uh, you know, let's just all get together and forget about our differences right. in belief and let's just pretend they don't exist. Yes, like one world order, one yeah, world church. Yeah. Or and and uh, yes, there's probably a whole camp or a whole school that would, would ascribe to that, but that's certainly not the official position of my church as well as other groups like evangelicals and Catholics right. together. Uh, there are some great things going on. The, the World Lutheran Federation is in dialogue with the, with the Catholic uh, Church, you know, the Vatican. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in these circles, ecumenism means let's concentrate, first of all, on what we share in common. Mm -hmm. You know, the subtitle of the book here is Our Common Heritage. Uh, you know, the glass of water is half full. It may mm -hmm. be half empty, but it is half, half full. full. So yes. let's let's concentrate on that first and and become brothers, uh, you know, in what we do hold in common. And then let's begin to look at the things that we at this point see that divide us: doctrinal differences or different ways of theology. And let's begin to dialogue and and listen to one another. And above all, seek the Holy Spirit so yes. that the the anointing of God can come upon us and bring forth that unity. That's what true ecumenism really is all about. It's not about compromise. Right. You know. As a matter of fact, uh, the previous Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, when he was head of the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith, uh, he said that he said uh, there, there's a certain view of ecumenism where we basically dial down our differences and, and we we look for a compromise. Truth no. cannot be compromised. Right. 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 We need to go to we need to go to the altar together, listen to one another, and if necessary, pray together and say, yes. God, show us what the real truth is. And and we have had uh, an experience not too long ago where that actually happened with a group of heretics. There was there's well heretics from from the way the way we look at the Trinity. There was mm -hmm. a group of Christians called the I believe it was the Assyrian Church of the East that did not really believe in the Trinity in the way that we do. They okay. believed in the Trinity, but they defined the the. The, it's, it's pretty complicated theologically, but they define the person of Jesus in a way that was different than the rest of Christian. you know, Christianity. Mm -hmm. And what they did, again, through a process of dialogue and presumably prayer, is they saw that it was really a matter of nuances and differences in the vocabulary that needed yes. to be straightened out. Dialogue. Dialogue, you know? yes. Is this what you're really saying? Oh, I thought you were saying this. Yes. You know? And then finally, that segment of, of you know, uh, of of what was formerly an Orthodox Christian church got reassimilated back into, into the main line of Christianity. That's it right. can be done. It can be done, By yes. the grace of God. Now, uh, unity or uh, does not necessarily mean conformity, right? right. Because, right. I mean, there is so much beauty and diversity. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as you were saying, uh, we need to get back to believing in the truth the mm -hmm. real truth and all this other stuff. Well, we're going to have our differences no matter what, mm -hmm. you know, but um, that's very important. Mm -hmm. I think that um, we get back to the fundamental truths in, in the gospel. Yes, that's and our foundation. That's our foundation. And you give such a great illustration on uh, the, the having a, a firm foundation with the t leaning Tower of Pisa, mm -hmm. right? I thought that was very, explain that. Well, uh, most people have heard about the Leaning Tower of Pisa because it's, a, it's an oddity and now it's a tourist attraction, you see. And uh, when I did my research on that, I found out that uh, actually the, the architect that first designed it, uh, you know, it, it started leaning and he actually gave up the project. And there have been various attempts over the centuries to try to correct it. And uh, most of the attempts failed. Uh, and there were some pretty ingenious things that people, you know, engineers and scientists in the mm -hmm, 20th mm -hmm. century, we'll figure this out. Right, uh, right. And that's when the, tire, the tower actually came to its closest uh, to collapsing. Uh, so, so bottom line was uh, that, uh, you know, Pisa is a town, I, I believe, at a certain elevation where uh, it's, it's on a riverbank and, and a lot of the, the soil is just not, you know, um, tight and it's not really capable of holding a foundation. And, and so right now they just let it be. Uh, I, I think they've corrected it in the sense that right now they're not worried about it falling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but the bottom line is 
and no pun intended, the bottom line is uh, it, needs, it needs a new foundation. I mean, that's the only way that it'll stand straight again. Right, right. And so I use that analogy to say that's exactly the problem that we're facing in Christianity today. Unlike the Tower of Pisa, however, we can, we can. repave the foundation and rebuild the church on that foundation. A Amen. And that's because, our salvation message. Because the body of Christ was not meant to be leaning right. or crooked, right. right? We were meant to be solid right. and firm and, right. and whole. That's right. And I mean, I just love that, um, your message, because in a world, wouldn't it be just great where Christianity, look at the power that we have, yes, that yes, we would have, yes. instead of uh, so much um, division in, in the world, mm -hmm. but we, we could just turn this world around mm -hmm. if the Christians would just do what Jesus said, yeah, right? Yeah. right? And, and now you were talking too about um, the two uh, giants that needed to be defeated racism and denominationalism, yes, right? Yes. Talk about that. Okay, well, first of all, I have to give credit where credit is due. That was actually a quote from uh, Bill McCartney, Coach Bill McCartney, who, who founded Promise Keepers. Okay. And uh, this is really in his heart, was to bring the body of Christ together in his men's movement. Uh, but I remember at the first event I ever attended, the, uh, the presenter quoted him and it just struck me. Mm -hmm. And um, he basically says, you know, two giants, like two Goliaths, just like Goliath mocked the people of God mm -hmm. in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And then really brought, brought a, a stirring of fervor in a, in a man like David, young man like David. So too today, the enemy, you know, the, the, the enemy, uh, meaning the, the, the devil himself, I mean, he still, in a certain sense, mocks the body of Christ because he's able to point at us and say, you're still divided because of race and you're still divided because of this thing called denomination. And, um, and so I've come to, to uh, really embrace this as one of my life passion and goals is to, is to take those giants out. Amen. And, and that may sound like a big order, but uh, through my association with Promise Keepers, I was actually on the steering committee when we mm -hmm. had an office here in Chicago uh, a while back. Uh, you know, we, there, there are actual materials published where you break it down into steps about how does this actually occur? And it's not rocket science. It's really a lot to do with just human dynamics of how do we listen to one another, build relationship, and, and resolve conflict. And that's so Jesus, isn't it? I yeah. mean, because Jesus is all about relationship yes, and yes, love. Yes, I mean, if yes. we had that, boy, mm -hmm. we could solve a lot of problems yes, in this world, yes, right? Yes. And so prejudice is another word that's, mm -hmm. I mean, most people think when we, when we think about prejudice we think of racist, but pre prejudice happens every day, even in, in obviously, right, in mm -hmm. Christianity. So sure. talk about that. Well, prejudice actually comes from uh, the, the Latin words that mean to judge beforehand, to make an assessment before uh, you really have all the facts. And we all do it. Mm -hmm. and it's all part of our nature. Uh, where our perceptions are limited. The problem is that when we lock into our own perceptions, uh, then we could leave out a lot of facts and a lot of information that would possibly help us to see things in a different fashion. And like you said, the usual way that, that we encounter that is through racial groups. Mm -hmm. You know, we're raised in a particular racial group and, and then we're sort of taught to perceive other racial groups in, in that way. But that can be true with any people groups. And so what I have found is that this is really what we're struggling with between Catholics and Protestants. We have certain perceptions based on our own experience, mm -hmm. You know, and, and nobody can deny experience, but a humble person will at least say, well, wait a minute, that's how I saw it, but that may not be the way it is. Can I walk a thousand miles in your moccasin to find out what your experience is all about? Mm -hmm. Can I hear what you have to say about your, your life and your teachings and your, uh, your belief systems and, and, and how you view God? And can I learn something from that? Right. You know, that's how prejudice begins to, to break down. And, and when, we, when, we, uh, when, we, when we seek that kind of information about one another, you know, I always say information is revelation. Yes. When we seek the information, you tell me about what it's like to be you and I tell you what it's like to be me and we begin comparing notes, the whole picture begins to change. And that's what we need in the body of Christ. We do, we do. And that also comes in um, from a place of we have to humble ourselves yes. and not think yes. that we're just so right all the yes. time, you know. Yes. And, um, I know I mentioned Vasula Ryden to you, and she was here, and she gave the most beautiful um, formula, and I know that it's in, in the words too, and it's like humility mm -hmm. plus love mm -hmm. equals unity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I mean that is really what, what as Christians, mm -hmm. we just have to call upon the Lord to mm -hmm. 
put that uh, supernatural yes. love in our hearts because yes. without the Lord, I mean, you know, it, it's almost an impossibility, yeah. right? right. Uh, but, um, but yes. Now, now uh, what can you say about, um, well, to our audience, uh, how do they get right with God? I mean, I, as you said, this message, so many people even now have never heard it. Yes. And that is so surprising mm -hmm. to, uh, to me because, and to a lot of us, because I mean, this is America. We, we think that the gospel is preached all the time, mm -hmm. but um, not so, huh? Mm -hmm. So if you can, um, I'm not sure how long we have, uh, maybe in, in a couple of minutes, mm -hmm. if you can just look at that camera and sure. uh, just um, and just talk to the, to the audience. Sure, okay. sure. Well, uh, Maria talked about getting right with God, which implies that there's something about us that needs to get right with God and something about us that's naturally in, in, in the wrong shape. Uh, but but the, 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 first, um, the first point of the gospel, the good news, and that's why we call it good news, is that God loves us. God loves us as we are, uh, but he has a plan for our life that, that this reality called sin continues to block out. And sin is our responsibility. God didn't create sin. He left us with a free will. And there's something inside of us that continues to choose the wrong when God shows us very clearly what he wants in our life. And sometimes we don't even intend to. You know, I know in my life, uh, you know, there, there are things I slip into, attitudes or ways of looking, prejudices uh, uh, that I, I don't really intend. But it's in me and I have to take responsibility for that. Now, a lot of people think that, well, if I just balance out the scale, you know, and I do enough good works, it'll outweigh my bad works, and then I'll get into heaven. That's not what the Word of God says. Neither does the Catholic Church's teaching. Uh, basically, God doesn't abide with any sin. And so, uh, unless we're able to take that sin out completely, we can't bring it with us into the presence of God, either here or certainly in the hereafter. So that leaves us with a dilemma. And it's a dilemma that Paul the Apostle talked about in Romans chapter 7 when he said, what a wretched man am I? Who will, who will save me from this body doomed to death? We need to be saved from the effect of sin. Not as we see it, because we always you know, think of ourselves uh, in the most positive terms, but as God sees it, he loves us, but this sin is keeping us from him. So the good news is that we can't do anything about it. I, I haven't found the formula to kick the sin habit, and neither has anybody else. Uh, and so Jesus came to die on the cross for our sin and to give us forgiveness and righteousness as a free gift, as a new life. We have to accept that gift personally by repenting of sin once and for all, trusting in Jesus as our Lord and Savior and surrendering our life to him. That's what we call in the evangelical world being born again. It's what the Catholic Church calls the first and fundamental conversion. And when that really happens, and it's happened in my life. Nobody has to tell you that something has changed. You know you're living a new life. Amen. That is, that's very wonderful. Very wonderful. You know, I love that quote um, by uh, St. Augustine that you wrote in the book because this has to be a personal decision, yes. right? I mean, we have to decide for ourselves. Yes. Choose this, this day yes. who we will serve, yes. what we will do. Yes. And uh, he says... Um, uh, he said that um, the one who created you without your cooperation will not save you without your cooperation. So he, I mean, we have to just yield to God mm -hmm. and um, give ourselves to him. And, and the world is beautiful with God. Is it easy? No. No, of course <laughs> no, not. No, no. But that's the only way, right? Mm -hmm. Because Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say that he was a way. That's right. He said he was the way. Mm -hmm. He didn't say that he was part of some truth. Mm -hmm. He was the, the truth. truth. And then he said he didn't say that he was one of the ways, like so many people say. Mm -hmm. Well, there's so many ways. He said, "I am the In way, life, yeah. the, the way, the truth, truth and, and the life." life. So, uh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Can you believe that our time is 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 uh, gone? You know. So, uh, thank you, our viewing audience, for joining us today. If you want more information about our program, please contact me at uh, marigold1 at comcast.net or call me at 877-991-4800. Uh, check out my website, www.voicesinthewildernesstv. Until next time, I wish you good health, success, and spiritual growth.